Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second webinar in a series of events highlighting the various tours available to book through Indus Experiences. The COVID pandemic is running its course, but with the development and deployment of the National Vaccination Programme, we hope that we will be able to get back to exploring the world soon. Indus Experiences offer a range of bespoke tours to destinations across the Asian continent, and we're going to be putting on a series of events over the next few months in order to highlight where and how you can see some of the fabulous destinations they can take you to. Today's presentation, expertly hosted by Dr. Rosie Llewellyn-Jones, will offer a taster of our family history tours, tracing the history of the British Raj from its last capital in Delhi to its original capital in Kolkata, Calcutta, via Meerut with its large army cantonment, Lucknow, Cornpoor, and the mutiny of 1857, and the Danish settlement at Serampoor. Dr. Llewellyn Jones will offer a wealth of in-depth local and historical sites, insights. Before we hear from Rosie, we will hear from Asiya Zaga, Director of Marketing for Indus Experiences. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce Asiya Zaga, Director of Marketing for Indus Experiences. Asiya's interest in travel naturally stemmed from her father's passion for travel. She's been with the company for 14 years, but been the head tea girl since the last 25 years. Starting from the grassroots, she's been involved in all the areas of the business, from admin, operations, sales, and now marketing. Over the last decade, she's been very fortunate to have visited numerous countries, including India, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Morocco, Jordan, Malaysia, Croatia, Finland, and Turkey. So welcome back to the UK, Asiya, and over to you. Thank you, Howard, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This is our second webinar, our first titled Britain's Greatest Battle, Tour of Kahima, took place in November. We had some wonderful feedback from it. If it's something that you've missed, it is available to view on our YouTube channel. Now, I can't personally relate to ancestry research. My ancestors, I'm told, migrated from Iran to Kashmir and settled there. My grandfathers, great-grandfathers, great-great-grandfathers all lived in Kashmir, passed away there, are buried there. There's not much to research. There is, however, a little village in Iran, about 40 kilometers away from Tehran, which bears our family name, Sargar. And the people there even speak their own language called Zargari. It's amazing. Hopefully one day I'll be able to visit. I have, however, had this experience, this urge to travel to a cemetery, to go tomb hunting. And now this was back in the summer of 2019. I had finished a book by Rosie uh, titled True Tales of Old Lucknow. In this book, she details the journey of Queen Janab Alia Malikai Kishwar, the mother of the last ruler of Avad, Nabab Wajid Ali Shah. She journeyed to Britain to petition Queen Victoria directly, mother to mother against the expansionist policies of Lord Dalhousie, the Governor General of British India. Now this was absolutely fascinating for me. I'd never heard of Manikai Kishwar until then. Reading about her journey from Calcutta to Suez by sea, then over land to Alexandria, and then again by ship from Alexandria to Southampton was amazing. I'm amazed she even survived the journey. The Queen of Ovid reached Southampton aboard the SS Indus on 21st of August 1856. This whole journey she undertook in complete burda, which means she had to be shielded from the gaze of strangers. She travelled with her son, uh, her grandson, beg your pardon, her great-grandson, nine maids, 110 attendants, several soldiers and seven eunuchs. Now, this was woman who would have never left the women's quarters of her father or her husband's home. She crossed continents. I find this remarkable. She did succeed in meeting Queen Victoria in Buckingham Palace. On 4th of July, 1857, they had tea. In her daily journal, Queen Victoria writes about this meeting. After luncheon, received the Queen of Oud, much trouble in arranging that no man should look at her. She threw back her veil and kissed my hand, which the grandson also did. She was much weighed down by her heavy dress, her crown and jewels, being very small. 
end quote. Things didn't quite work out for Queen Kishwa, and she passed away. Interestingly, not in Britain, but in France. She was laid to rest in a cemetery in Paris, Père Lachaise, and I simply had to go. The day that I booked my ticket to France, Notre Dame went up in flames. I took this as a sign from the universe, telling me to go before some other calamity befell. And I'm so glad I did. Otherwise, I'd be here today telling you how I wished I'd gone in that summer of 2019. I spent the best part of two days in that cemetery, looking for this tomb. My feet were sore by the time I eventually found it in desperate need of some TLC. I paid my respects. Now, that was a cemetery in Paris. I knew who I was looking for. I knew she would have a plaque or something on her tomb. I had a map. There were plot numbers in the cemetery. The paths were concrete. They were even, beautifully laid out. Now, cemeteries in India, on the other hand, that's a different story. But don't let that put you off. If you have some family buried in India, but you don't know their whereabouts, you may have some sort of idea of where they worked or where they were married or had a vague idea of where they may have been born. We have some wonderful resources in the, in the UK in the shape of Baxa and Fibis. Both of these are registered charities and they work tirelessly to collect and record information pouring over birth, marriage, death records of millions of Britishers scattered in cemeteries across South Asia. There are, more, there are more than 800 of these cemeteries in India alone. We encourage you to let us know about these family graves you may wish to visit. We can, if you like, in advance, get boots on the ground, research them, make sure we clear them off debris, or even just make sure they exist before you commit to traveling across the seas. I will hand you over to Rosie now. Do take care of yourselves and of each other. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much for that update, Asiya. Um, for those of you who would like to get in touch with the team at Indus Experiences after this event, uh, we will place their contact details in the chat box and there'll be a, uh, a, a screen later which will have all the details. Uh, so now we're going to uh, receive our main presentation and for that I would like to introduce Dr Rosie Llewellyn-Jones who you can see on screen right now. Uh, Rosie studied Urdu and Hindi at the School of Oriental and African Studies where she was awarded a first class honours degree in 1973 and completed her PhD there in 1980 which was subsequently published as A Fatal Friendship, The Nawabs, The British and the City of Lucknow in 1985. She's written a number of books and is the archivist for the Royal Society for Asian Affairs and an experienced guide working with leading tour operators. These make her an ideal guide for family history tours as she is well attuned to what people really want to see when they visit India. She visits the subcontinent as frequently as possible and was an invited speaker at a recent Jaipur Literature Festival. She was a council member of the Royal Asia Asiatic Society and was awarded an MBE in 2015 for Ooh. services to the British Association for Cemeteries in South Asia, AXA, and British India Studies. Rosie, over to you. <laughs> thank you, Howard. And uh, thank you, Isia, too. That was really interesting about the cemetery in Paris, Père Lachaise, and I'm glad you eventually found the grave. So we're going on our own grave experiences. Um, let's have the first slide, please. Imperial India, what a vision those words conjure up. And this is actually one of my favorite pictures. It's a good one to start the lecture with. Of course, India doesn't really look much like this today, but you have to have a romantic image, I think, in your mind before traveling to India. And this sums it up very well indeed. And talking about find your ancestors, it's absolutely amazing the number of people who have Indian connections. You talk to someone and say you're interested in India. Oh, my great uncle was there. I've got an ancestor who worked in the East India Company. 
can you help me find the grave? So these things are actually very well connected. And this is why the tour is called Imperial India, find your ancestors. So I'm going to give you a brief itinerary of the places we're going to go on the tour in 2022. Next, Skinner's Church. Now this is in Old Delhi. This was built by James Skinner. He was an interesting man. He was an Anglo-Indian, which means that his father was Scottish and his mother was a Rajput princess. So he was a fairly mixed exotic blood. And the reason this church came about, it's in Old Delhi, was that Skinner was a soldier. He actually had his own small regiment called Skinner's Horse. And he'd been wounded in battle in 1800. And he vowed as he lay on the battlefield that if he survived, he would build a church, a mosque and a temple. So you can see he was actually hedging his bets. <laughs> We're not sure about the mosque or the temple, but certainly this church resulted from that vow made on the battlefield. It took quite a long time to come to fruition. In fact, it wasn't built and consecrated until 1836. So that was 36 years after Skinner had been wounded. But it is a lovely church. It, it really is absolutely splendid and it's in very good condition, as you can see. Skinner himself is actually buried inside the church and there are interesting graves outside too, including a small family Skinner cemetery. And while we're here, just have a look at the, um, at the couple, at the, um, the bit on top of the dome here with the cross there because that's going to occur in the next slide. Next, Kashmir Gate. And while you've still got the memory of St. James's Church Dome in your mind, just look a little to the left, slightly left of centre, and you can actually see the dome peering over the Kashmir Gate. So these places are very close together in Old Delhi. Now, the Kashmir Gate brings us straight into the mutiny story. You probably know that during 1857 and 1858, mutiny occurred in India for all kinds of reasons. I'm not going to go into this at length, but what it meant basically was that there was an uprising of soldiers and some civilians against British rule, against the rule of the East India Company. And a few places were badly affected, including Delhi, now, Delhi at that time was surrounded by city walls and gates, and this is the Kashmir Gate. And the British were outside trying to get into the city to restore order. And this was the gate where they actually succeeded. Gunpowder was put against the gate and blown open. And had this not happened, then the British would not have been able to get back into Delhi. And the whole course of history might have been very, very different. So this is an important reminder of the mutiny. And I'm happy to say it still stands today. The moat has gone, but we can certainly walk around and have a look and look at the plaques of people who actually died there. And talking about Baxa, as Isaiah did, it stands for the British Association for Cemeteries in South Asia. We're one of the oldest heritage groups to be working in India. We actually predate INTAC, which is their heritage group. We were set up in 1977. And the idea is that we raise money, we're a charity, we raise money in order to restore old European cemeteries before 1947. And this is one of our recent projects. It's the Nicholson Christian Cemetery in Old Delhi. And again, it's near the Kashmir Gate. It's near St. James's Church. So we don't have too much wandering around to do. We're actually very pleased with this because we worked with INTAC, the Indian Heritage Group, to restore the gatehouse and also a few tombs inside. And it's called the Nicholson Cemetery because it's where John Nicholson is buried. And he was one of the officers trying to recapture Delhi during 1857, John Nicholson. He wasn't a particularly pleasant person. And to me, and I'll come back to this in a minute, it's fascinating to me to see how British heroes, heroes to us, are still remembered and their tombs still respected in India, even 
today. And when we talk about statues being pulled down and the past being glided over, if you like, it's fascinating that India hasn't succumbed to the madness of trying to erase our heritage. Next, please. New Delhi. So we do have a chance to go round New Delhi as well. We'll actually be staying in a hotel in New Delhi. And having visited the old part, you really need to see this as well. You probably know that it was designed by Lutchins and Baker. It actually opened in 1921, the, though the idea of a new city, a new capital, had actually been discussed before the First World War. The war actually delayed building, but it was opened, as I say, in 1921. It's absolutely spectacular. I can't describe to you how exciting it is just to be there on these very, very long vistas and look towards Parliament House. Now, we have heard that the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is actually thinking about changing the whole of the Parliament structure. He wants to build a new Parliament building to, I suppose, say, you know, what the British did is, is no longer suitable. And one sees his point, but these are such good buildings that they, they won't be demolished or destroyed, and we will have the chance to see them. So this is really exciting. We're not just dwelling in the past, we're looking at Parliament today in India. It's absolutely spectacular. Next. And so from Delhi, we're going on to Mirut. And again, talking about the mutiny, Mirut is where it actually started. You probably know the story of the greased cartridges. And yes, I mean, that, that is true, but that was just the final spark that started the mutiny. And it started here when Indian soldiers working for the East India Company killed their officers, rose up, marched to Delhi, and asked the last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, if he would head up the mutiny, the rebellion, the uprising, whatever you call it. These are actually earlier tombs in Mirut. There are only a few mutiny graves here, but this is just to give you some idea of the absolute splendor of European funerary architecture in India. And the reason it's so spectacular is that labor was very cheap, building materials were very cheap. And so you get Europeans of quite humble backgrounds sometimes being able to afford absolutely splendid monuments that they could never have hoped to achieve at home. So we get all kinds of things. We get domes, we get obelisks, we get pyramids. And even if you don't actually have ancestors in India, or you're not particularly interested in that, I think you will be staggered by the absolute splendor of some of these European cemeteries. I certainly am. Next, please. And so from Meerut, we're going on to Lucknow, which is a city I know very well, obviously, having written a lot about it. And Lucknow is interesting because it is primarily still a Shia city, that is the Nawabs, whom Isata was talking about, um, were Shias, and this is the minority Muslim sect, if you like. Sunnis are the majority, Shias the minority. And in mainly Hindu setting, they still managed to build incredible structures. We're looking here down onto the Rumi Darvaza, that, that extraordinary structure you see in the background. And it is said when it was first created that those little, how would I describe them, pinnacles on top were actually fountains. And when they were turned on, the whole thing was, was like a gigantic fountain. Not like that today, unfortunately, but I do want to show you Lucknow. It's a city I know very well. I have a lot of friends there. Next, please. And I mentioned earlier about John Nicholson, how his tomb is in Old Delhi. Now, this I find even more interesting because this is the tomb of Captain William Hodson. And Hodson was a really nasty piece of work. It was Hodson who actually shot the sons of the last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar. He shot them. He'd been asked to bring them back into Delhi and he said he felt threatened. He had, 
his own soldiers with him, but he actually massacred them in cold blood. So it's quite amazing that his tomb remains not only undefiled, but is actually celebrated um, once a year. And the tomb is in the grounds of La Martinier College in Lucknow. I've got a picture of that in a minute. And every year, soldiers from Hodson Horse, Hodson's Horse, which is now a unit within the regular Indian army, come to Lucknow and they parade around and they have a ceremony and they have prayers and they lay wreaths. And this to me is really quite extraordinary. And in fact, one of the houses at La Martinier College is actually still called Hodson's House. And when you think how the British are very quick to disclaim Clive, Robert Clive of India, I still think this is a fascinating anomaly. <laughs> Next, please. And also in Lucknow, this is the gateway to one of the sites which was very bitterly fought over in 1857. It's called the Sekundabagh. And we can go into it. But the only thing I wanted to show you were the um, fissures above the archway. And these fissures are emblems of Ovid, of old Ovid. Ovid is it's mainly now UP, Uttar Pradesh. But when we're talking about Harvard, we're talking about pre-1947 pre India. And the fishes are a symbol, as I say. So whenever you see fishes, um, you're pretty sure you're talking about Lucknow. Next, please. And from Lucknow, we do a day's journey to Cornpore. It's not that far away. I think it's about 30 miles or something like that. We can easily do it in a day. And Cornpore is where the worst excesses of the mutiny took place. A large number of Britons were killed. Certainly 200 women and children, British women and children were massacred. And the Angel of Redemption was erected on the spot where the bodies had been buried in a well. It was probably the worst atrocity that the British had ever suffered. This is not to forget the atrocities that the Indians themselves suffered too, countless. We really don't know how many, but nevertheless, this is something we can see in Cornpore. Next, please. And this is where one of the massacres took place, which is why it's called Massacre Ghat, obviously. And it is surprisingly unchanged. You can actually walk down the steps to the right hand side and stand and look over the Ganges where a large number of British men were actually drowned or burnt alive in boats. They'd been promised safety. They were hoping to sail down to Allahabad, but as soon as they got on board, the thatches above the boats were fired. Flaming arrows were thrown onto the thatch roof, which of course set the whole thing on fire. So if they weren't burnt alive, they were drowned because they were also being shot at from the banks. So this is something else we'll see in Cornpore. Next, please. And back to Lucknow, because we do return to Lucknow before moving on. This is a school I told you about, La Martiniere. It's absolutely splendid. It was finished about 1800. And it is one of the best boys public schools in India. We're very lucky because we'll have a chance to meet the headmaster, who is a friend of mine. We'll be shown around. It's been recently refurbished and it really is an absolutely splendid 18th century Baroque palace. And if we're very lucky, we might be able to go up on top of the roof. So that's La Martinier in Lucknow. Next, please. And we're on to Calcutta, and we're going to stay at the Grand Hotel. It's now called the Grand Oberoi Hotel, but it does look pretty much like this. There are still shops at pavement level, which are very useful because they're nice antique shops. And I always think part of the pleasure of taking people around India is taking them shopping. There's no point in just spending all your time in cemeteries or looking at buildings. You want to get out and hit the shops too, and we'll allow plenty of time for that. The Grand Hotel is quite splendid. The entrance is now around the side. And one thing I learned, which rather amused me, there's a large swimming pool 
inside. It's open to the sky. I don't do swimming at all, but I know lots of people like to do it. And this apparently used to be the ballroom. It used to be roofed over and you can imagine people elegantly dancing in the 1930s. Well, that shows how things have changed from dancing to swimming. <laughs> Next, please. Now, there, there's a lot to see in Calcutta, obviously a huge amount. And one of the things we'll be looking at is the Victoria Memorial Hall. This was built by Emerson and it was really Lord Curzon's repost, I was going to say, or response to the Taj Mahal. He wanted to make his mark. He was the Viceroy of India and he wanted to make his mark on Calcutta and he did quite spectacularly. Interesting, it's still called the Victoria Memorial Hall because it's got an enormous statue of Queen Victoria at the entrance. She's seated there looking very grand and it's a statue that hasn't been removed. And what's also interesting about um, the exhibits inside, it's got the largest uh, collection of company paintings. And these are paintings done during the 18th and early 19th century, mainly for officers who were serving in the East India Company by artists like Johann Zoffany, William Hodges, Tilly Kettle, uh, you name any painter from that period and there'll be something here. It's absolutely spectacular. So I always enjoy looking at those. Next, please. And here we are, we are actually in a cemetery now. We're in South Park Street Cemetery. This is probably the most spectacular cemetery, I think in the Indian subcontinent. And it's interesting that Asya mentioned Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. Now, lots of people think Père Lachaise was the first planned cemetery that is with open paths. It wasn't just random burials. It actually has paths and areas are split into rectangles. But South Park Street Cemetery predates it by more than 50 years. It's a wonderful cemetery. And I have actually been with people who have found their ancestors here. So it's not just an idle boast about finding your ancestors. People have actually found them here. And one thing, um, as Isaiah mentioned, BAXA, British Association for Cemeteries in South Asia, has done a huge amount of research on where people are buried, where we might find people buried. We have very extensive lists of cemeteries and burial registers throughout South Asia, but we do concentrate on the Indian subcontinent. So plenty of time for finding your ancestors. Next, please. And Serampore, we're actually going upriver. We're going up the Hooghly to Serampore, which is interesting because this was a Danish settlement. We tend to think of India as British India, but this isn't always the case. There are certain little pockets where other Europeans came in, Chandernagore for the French, of course, and Serampore College, set up actually by an Englishman, the missionary William Carey, simply because he wasn't allowed to be a missionary in Calcutta, which was very much British India. So he set up the college at Serampore. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to go inside. There's also a little museum which explains about the importance of the Danish influence on Bengal, which isn't something that everybody knows about. Next, please. And this is where we're going to finish up for lunch. It's called the Danish Tavern and it looks, it looks very respectable, but it was in ruins until quite recently when the Danish government took the initiative to refurbish it. And there are several places like this in Serampore, including St. Olaf's Church. The Danish government, to their credit, have put in a lot of money and a lot of effort. It's all been done with Indian labor and obviously Indian cooperation. And this is where we will probably have lunch. If we don't have lunch on the boat, then we'll stop here for high tea. So I'm going to leave you perhaps a bit surprisingly with a Danish picture rather than a British one. But I do look forward to welcoming you on the tour. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, an incredibly interesting presentation. Uh, now, obviously, there's uh, everyone who's who's come here is 
now thinking, well, yes, I definitely want to go on this tour. Um, and uh, we'll give you the details in the next few slides about how you can get in touch, uh, you know, details about the tour and how you can get in touch with Indus Experiences to um, to book it, which obviously at some point we will start traveling again and we need to be ready. And uh, so going on Rose's tour at the beginning of 2022 is definitely something that we can all consider. Um, so now we're going to move on to a Q&A uh, session. And for that, I'm going to invite Yasin Zaga to appear on screen. Uh, those of you who know Indus Experiences will know Yasin very well. I've got some questions of my own, which I'm now going to ask to, to Rosie and, uh, and Yasin. And my first question is to Rosie. Um, Rosie, <clears throat> Have you faced any resentment or any ill feeling from locals when you visit the cemeteries? Hmm, that's interesting you should say that. Um, no, I never have actually. And I found people incredibly helpful. Occasionally you're not quite, well, this is talking, you know, on, on my own. Occasionally I've had difficulty finding cemeteries. So I've asked people and they've actually come with me or they've sent a small boy that said, we know where it is so-and-so will take you there, and they have. Um, no resentment at all, and in fact, people are usually quite glad to see you there, especially if they're the Chokidar. This is the man, it's usually a man who looks after the cemetery. Chokidar just means a watchman, and they'll very happily show you around. I always tip them. Um, no resentment at all. In fact, I've, I've been lucky. I've never faced resentment of any kind in India. That's great to hear. Really good to hear. Um, yeah, th I can see that there are some questions coming in, but I, I, I've got, just got some, some more questions of my own, which I'm going to ask. Uh, so uh, here we go. Um, so this is this is aimed at either of you. Either of you could ask this, Rosie or Yasin. Um, where are the majority of the cemeteries in India, and would it be possible to visit a couple in the different parts in one itinerary? It's probably uh, Yasin. Thank you, Howard. Yes, quite easily possible. What we do is we offer a bespoke travel service. So a possibility is to arrange such a tour before the main group tour or after. There is also a service we offer as complete bespoke travel. If someone wants to go entirely to research their ancestors, we can create an itinerary exclusively for them. Excellent. Anything, anything you want to add to that, Rosie? Obviously, there are cemeteries all over India because the British were all over India from the hill stations like Shimla and Mussoorie right down to the south to Madras, where there's a huge cemetery. So you can't go far without finding an old European cemetery. And as Yasin said, if we know in advance, we can organize things. We, we can get you information, too. Yeah, so so basically, so so it is possible then to add to the Imperial India tour. It's not something that's completely set in stone. You could tweak bits here and there. Is that, that correct? That's right. You you can have add-ons yeah. at either end. Excellent. Uh, anything uh, any anything you want to add to that, Yasin? About you know what uh, people could possibly do with the tour? Well, actually, we started this initiative in about four years back. Then we uh, arranged a program to visit North India. South India and East India. We started the program of family history tours from North India. The group came back. Then another group went from here to visit South India. Then another group joined to go to East India. And some of the participants of the tour, they did two of those or all three of those. That was fascinating. I need to point back to the first question you put to Rosie about is there any resentment? Absolutely not. People are very helpful to help people clear the rubbish. And at this point of time, I would like to uh, mention a quote from Mr. Peter Boone, the secretary boxer. His ancestors are buried in Missouri. And he writes, when the graves were covered in undergrowth, it was sad to see them. But once the area was cleared, we had a great deal of satisfaction. We felt we had done right by our ancestors. We had come to look after them. And we have had many satisfactory clients, independent travelers traveling in the group, who have fulfilled their dream, including a client. She's about 75 years old. And his dream was to go and restore the dream of her grandfather 
and to see the cannery which you owned in Concord. So things like this are for us as a tour operator, soul feeling experiences, which we would love to help anyone who wishes to go on such a tour. Great, okay, so that's, that's really great to hear. Um, the, the, just while you were you were saying all of that, Yasin, a, a comment actually came in from, from Amanda Richmond, and she wants to say that this is, it's not a question, it's just an endorsement of indus, indus experiences as a travel operator. We've been clients for over 20 years, she says. So uh, that's very good to hear, isn't it? Absolutely, I'm so thankful. Yes, that's yes. right. Um, my, my last question, actually, before <clears throat> before I get on to some of the, the lovely questions that will be coming in, uh, and I can see that there's a, there's a comment there about uh, somebody... Um, Gillian here, yeah, and there's been a response to it already about, um, yeah, Rose has already commented on that about finding out where her great grandpa was buried. So that's that's good to know as well. Um, so my last question, really, before I get on to everybody else's questions, is uh, is the issue of travel insurance. Now, travel insurance is something that's uh, become quite a, an important thing to consider in the last ten months. Um, now, obviously, the tour we're specifically talking about here is March 2022, and we hope that the world is a little bit easier to move around in by that point. But what is the situation with travel insurance at the moment? Uh, insurance companies are working ways out to cover COVID and some insurance companies are already offering cover against COVID pandemic. Okay. Uh, there's a good deal of, there's an association of British insurers. There is a company called the Travel in General who do it. And those insurances are available and they will become easier as we move on. I know of one company who said we must have insurance cover about 90 days before departure, but it is now becoming a routine. Hopefully insurance policies will be underwritten for future travelers. Excellent, that's very, very good to hear. So uh, <clears throat> travel insurance will be a, a very important thing for everybody when they travel uh, from, from now on. So uh, it's good to know that there are travel insurance companies looking after people. So now uh, questions that have come in, um, the first question I'm going to ask, uh, is, I'll ask Rosie this, it's come from Sonia McDonald. It says, how many people will be in the group? We usually like to have, say, between 12, 16 or 18, because I think once you get above that number, um, it becomes logistically harder to move people around. And I also find from experience, I've been leading groups for a very long time, if you get above a certain number, it then starts to break down into smaller groups. And I actually like to keep us keep the group together rather than sort of separate little groups. So I'd say about um, 16 to 18 is a comfortable number. It's a comfortable number for me anyway. OK, and and all those people have to book that they have to book it through into experiences and then you you take all the details from there they can't yes. book in any other way okay so that's and good obviously if i could just say if anybody is specifically looking for an ancestral grave anywhere on our route the more information we have in advance the more research we can do yeah um well the, this specific, specific tour is march next year so there's plenty of time to get that research done yes. before, before you head over um uh, so um Peter Mackinnon wants to know, and apologies if I pronounce your name wrong, Peter, um, is the tour too exhausting for a reasonably fit octogenarian? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad he asked that because I'm, I'm a reasonably fit octogenarian myself. So if I can do it, you can do it. Definitely. I think the answer to that is yes, please do come along, Peter, yes. I think. <laughs> Uh, right. Um, so uh, on the subject of uh, yeah, travel insurance and things, um, what about visas, Yasin? Is that something that people have to consider with this? Well, the visa for India are pretty easy now. It is an online application and the confirmation of the visa comes by email. Uh, they don't have to send their passports anywhere. So the visa process for visiting to India is, is fairly, very straightforward and very easy. Not at the moment, of course, because of the pandemic, but that is how it has been for the last couple of years. And it has taken a, a great deal of hassle. I know yeah. some people had lots of complications before, but not now. Fairly, very easy. Just an application online and the visa is granted. Okay. And is that something that's done through you or they have to do that separately? 
most of the people who are computer savvy can do it themselves. We send them a step-by-step -step guide. Okay. But if someone is not that computer savvy, on the day he wants to file an application, we stand at the back of the phone, tell him what to do here, how to do here, press this button, and we help them through that process. Some people have difficulty sizing photographs for the form. So we help them as well. So help is available free of charge to a client who has worked with us. Excellent. Okay. Um, and our next question, uh, this is this is probably going to be answered by Rosie. It's come from Janet Dixon, actually. The last question about Vita is also came from Janet, but this is, uh, she says, and what balance will there be between our travels and talks, introductions, follow-up points by Rosie? Shall I read that again, Rosie? Yes. Um, well, what we did last time, and it worked fairly well, I would give a short talk every evening. We would find somewhere convenient to sit either before dinner or after dinner, or sometimes even when we're on the coach. So I would prepare people for the following day's events. And obviously I can answer questions. So I aim to do probably a short talk every evening. Okay. Um, and obviously when you're staying in lovely hotels like the Grand Oberoi, then it's lovely surroundings to be listening yes, to your indeed. lovely, lovely talks at, the, at that time. And lo uh, lovely food too. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, yes. yeah. Mm. One of the, some of the best hotels in the world. So, yeah, uh, mm. yeah. I'll be there. Great. Um, <laughs> right. I've only got one more question actually, and this has come from Robin Percival. It says, "Does Sir Henry Lawrence have a grave or tomb in Lucknow?" He certainly does. Um, he's buried in the residency cemetery, and the residency is a fascinating area. It is almost virtually untouched since the day the British were evacuated in November 1857. So a lot of it is ruinous, but there is a small museum there in the main building itself. And I'm very familiar with Henry Lawrence's tomb because I always make a little pilgrimage there and say a short prayer and sometimes just put a wreath on the tomb. So yes, absolutely there. And I know where it is. Excellent. Uh, so that's that's something to look forward to. Um, that, that's all the questions I've got, actually. I don't know if there's anything, Rosie or Yasin, that, as, that you think that we haven't covered yet that people might be uh, interested in hearing about the tour. Or, uh, we're going to show some slides in a moment, which has got some contact details in case you want to get in touch with everybody to to um, and here they here they come, in fact. So, Rosie, Yasin, is, is there anything else that you, you want to add that we may not have covered? Um, no, not, not, not from my part. I think that's it. Uh, not from mine either, I think we'll be good. And anyone, if you have, if they have any questions, there's an email on a slide which is coming now. They're very welcome to ask questions and we will try to help. Excellent. Okay, so uh, with there being no further questions, and we've we've had all the information from Rosie and Yasin that uh, that hopefully that you need, um, that that will be the the end of our our webinar. Uh, a very very interesting. Oh, actually, no, just before we go, one more question before I wrap this up: Is there one particular place on the tour that really encapsulates the essence of British India? And that's come from Stephen McLarence. Oh, I think undoubtedly Calcutta, because Calcutta was the um, the capital for many, many years. It, it's a very, very fine city. It really is. It, it's got a sort of imperial grandeur about it. And I actually prefer Calcutta to Delhi because you can walk around in Calcutta. Delhi, in some ways, New Delhi is an artificial city because it was built for processions, carriage processions. It's not easy to walk around New Delhi. So I'd say Calcutta, certainly. Excellent, Excellent Rosie, thank you very much. And so uh, that's the end of our webinar. Um, thank you very much for everyone for coming. Uh, that's the, the end of it, the, the second in our series of events promoting Indus Experiences Tours. Um, if you'd like to see a recording of our previous event about Kahuma Ridge, as Asiya mentioned earlier, then please let us know. Uh, we'll be in touch to let you know about future events, but we expect these to take place every two months. <clears throat> so keep an eye out for details of our March event, which will come to you via email. In the meantime, thank you to Asiya, to Yasin and to Rosie for your valuable input today. Uh, please do get in touch with the team at Indus Experiences to discuss your trips in 2021 if, if, you, uh, if you're 
thinking of going away in 2021 or if you want to get in touch to talk about Rose's tour in the start of 2022 um, either way uh, get in touch with Yasin and, and Asiya to talk about the trips that you want to make um, in the meantime please follow government advice stay safe thank you all very much for coming and we hope to see you next time thank you I hope you enjoyed the webinar you can find out more information on our family history tours by logging on to www.indusexperiences.co.uk, click Experiences tab on the top, and you can find our history tours featured there. To watch our previous webinar, we will leave a link in the description box. And to keep updated on our future webinars, travel information, do subscribe to our newsletter. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Thank you.